In 1964, the United States Supreme Court heard the case of Jacob Ellis v. Ohio. Nico Jacob Ellis was the manager of the Heights Art Theater in Coventry Village, Cleveland Heights, Ohio, and he had been charged with possessing and exhibiting an obscene film, a crime in Ohio at the time that, in the Cuyahoga County Court of Common Pleas, earned him fines totaling $2,500. In modern dollars, that would be around 23000 The movie in question, by the way, was Louis Mal's Le Amont, released in America as The Lovers. The Supreme Court overturned the conviction of Jacob Ellis, but while the majority of justices agreed that the film was not obscene, they could not agree on why it was not obscene leading to a case with no majority opinion, but multiple concurring opinions. Among those opinions, Justice Potter Stewart would pen a line that would haunt him for the remainder of his life, saying with regards to the definition of hardcore pornography, I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of material I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description and perhaps I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so. But I know it when I see it, and the motion picture involved in this case is not that. That's a lot of words to basically say, guys, I really don't want to say it out loud, but we all know what I'm talking about. Virtually overnight, I know it when I see it became a punchline, and as legal precedent, it's admittedly shaky ground. It's basically one of the highest offices of the land, admitting that it couldn't really describe how the law should be enforced because, hey, it's really kind of a subjective thing and one person's trash is another person's masterpiece is another person's hell of a weekend. Censorship in Japan is a touchy subject, in part because since Japan signed Articles of Surrender in 1945, censorship hasn't technically existed within the country. The Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces insisted that Japan had to adopt a policy of freedom of speech that precluded censorship. And this was even codified into Japan's new constitution in 1947. But in practice, there were two exceptions. The first was that, for a very long time, the United States government oversaw the censorship of any material in the press that it deemed subversive. In fact, Japanese journalists and free press advocates alike have argued that this particular censorship was even more restrictive than the censorship the press had experienced under the Japanese military during the Meiji era, because at least then the material could be printed with black bars or X'd out words over the material deemed unfit to print. But after 1945, censorship wasn't supposed to exist, so any subversive material had to be completely rewritten to remove the offending content giving the impression that no censorship had ever taken place. The second exception was, of course, for pornography. Hello, boys. Have a good night's rest. I missed you. When it comes to sexual subjects, the Allied forces and the United States government were totally cool with blatant censorship. As decades of laws against the depiction of human genitalia and the corresponding black bars, digital mosaics, and scratched out with a pin photographs give testimony to. As far as the West was concerned, free speech didn't include dirty pictures or movies, regardless of where they fell on the spectrum of innocence and perversion. Fans of anime today, even those who don't necessarily dabble in the more adults-only end of the medium, or, for that matter, even those who are just casually acquainted with the style, are familiar with what it means when the artwork includes, um, tentacles. It was around the 1980s that adult creators in Japan came up with the idea of giving supernatural threats tentacles, in particular tentacles that are eerily shaped like a certain part of the human anatomy. By doing this, they could skirt censorship laws that prohibited showing any form of genitalia on screen. After all, these were tentacles. 
They can't help it if, as Freud said, sometimes a cigar is just a phallus. It was a very 1980s solution to the problem, charmingly blunt and unsophisticated, possibly with more than a hint of cocaine involved. And as many think pieces as have been composed on the influence of Hokusai's 1814 woodblock print The Dream of the Fisherman's Wife on the choices made in 1985's Dream Hunter Rem, it really does all come down to avoiding the censors by following the letter of the law, not the spirit. But in 1969, when Osamu Tezuka produced Senya Ichiya Monogatari, or A Thousand and One Nights, he employed a different solution. People excited by the prospect of seeing cartoons doing it instead found their sex scenes represented by this pulsating mass of maybe flesh. Sure, it looks dirty, but what exactly are you looking at? I'll be honest, I'm actually kind of nervous because I don't know if I'm allowed to show you this completely abstract animation on most online video services, so I'm going to cut to some footage of kittens right now. Because somebody, somewhere, was looking at those undulating lines and thinking, I know it when I see it. But that little bit of doubt in what you're looking at, that inability to quite describe why the thing provokes the emotion that it does, was part of a long-standing tradition of surrealism that had long been used to avoid censorship and disguise sociopolitical commentary behind a layer of what is this I can't even. The term surrealism first appears in 1917 in the correspondence and writings of French playwright and author Guillaume Apollinaire. The term surreality and all of its variations was intended as a portmanteau of the words super reality, as in a reality that was more real than simple reality. Apollinaire saw surrealism as breaking down the rigid rules society had imposed upon self-expression and suggested that by opening their minds to the absurd and spontaneous, artists could be freed to express deep truths about reality that could never be put into realistic classical terms. Apollinaire's work gave birth to multiple surrealist movements, each publishing their own surrealist manifesto, but the most popular of them was probably the surrealist movement captained by Freudian psychiatrist-turned-poet André Breton. Under Breton, surrealism was understood to be a revolutionary philosophy, with Marxist and anarchic foundations, and further, surrealism was not simply that which was absurd or abstract, it could also consist of that which was ordinary and realistic as well, as long as it was approached creatively and with an eye toward dream logic. Among other creative exercises invented by the Surrealists or borrowed from the Dadaists who were a distinct movement, they embraced automatism, which involved setting one's hand going to create an illustration or a written work while divorcing it from conscious control. This, for example, is one of André Masson's automatic drawings from 1924, and that looks kind of familiar, almost like... Nope, nope, I'm still not certain I should be showing that. Put a cat up there. I've covered Osamu Tezuka's career in my previous video on Kenji Itsumi in Don Dracula. But to sum it up in general, Tezuka, while he may not have invented the manga industry, definitely revolutionized both comics and animation in his long career. When he set out to produce A Thousand and One Nights, the first of a trilogy he intended for adults, he was seeking to add yet another revolutionary feather to his cap. It was his hope that these three movies would establish that animation was an art form that could be for any and all age groups, not just for children. The movie was mostly traditionally animated, but filled with racy and culturally insensitive humor, sexual situations, and no, I'm not going to put it back up on the screen, but it did include that pulsating mass of maybe flesh that was intended to represent graphic sex without actually depicting it on the screen. 
It was an amazing surrealistic moment that allowed the movie to be released to theaters instead of being cut or even suppressed entirely. And in doing so, it actually fulfilled one of Apollinaire's and Breton's key goals for surrealism in the arts. It broke down the societal barriers to expression and allowed the artists to have a conversation with their audience that touched on subjects they could not otherwise speak about, even if that subject could be summed up as simply as people sometimes have sex and enjoy it very much. In its home country of Japan, A Thousand and One Nights was considered a box office success, bringing in 290 million yen, quite the haul for the day. But while it earned praise globally for being a daring piece of animation, it was largely roasted by international critics who felt it was about as sensual as a wet burlap sack, and by audiences who were expecting something a little more... You know, they didn't really know, but they would have known if they'd seen it, and that wasn't it. In 1970, Tezuka released Cleopatra, the second of the Anime Rama trilogy. And for this film, the graphic love scene had been further abstracted, this time down to a single undulating line, asking the audience to see sensuality in the simplest expression possible, a gently moving curve. Oh no, I wasn't concerned about the line being too dirty, I just wanted to see more kittens. This time around, the story was less straightforward than A Thousand and One Nights, working in a science fiction time travel angle. While the depiction of sex had been further abstracted, the movie doubled down on everything else that had made the first movie transgressive and potentially offensive, all while telling a bawdy, burlesque version of the story of Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, and Mark Antony. While A Thousand and One Nights had been distributed with an English-language dub in the West, Tezuka's Mushi Productions was in deep financial trouble by the time Cleopatra released, and in 1972, they allowed Xanadu Productions to push it into U.S. theaters in a quickly subtitled version. Xanadu changed the title to Cleopatra, colon, Queen of Sex, and released it with a self-imposed X rating, advertising it as the first X-rated animated movie to play in the USA. But it wasn't. Self-admitted Tezuka fanboy Ralph Bakshi had actually released Fritz the Cat just seven days earlier. Xanadu's marketing also promised wall-to-wall -wall smut, which Cleopatra wasn't. It was vulgar, lowbrow, and sophomoric, but, well, it had this line. American audiences looking for X-rated thrills were not happy with what they considered a bait-and-switch, and the box office reflected that. Critics, meanwhile, loved the animation, but complained it was wasted on a nothing story. Today, A Thousand and One Nights and Cleopatra are credited with opening the medium of animation in Japan, to a wide range of material that could be for every audience, for older audiences, or for one very specific audience. Greg, we all know. Whether they had the effect worldwide that Tezuka hoped they would have is debatable. Animation in America would remain kid stuff for decades afterward, even with animators like Bakshi trying to push it into a more adult arena. And it seems that most controversies over animated movies and shows in America still come from the mistaken belief that, because it's animated, it must be exclusively for kids. The third movie in Tezuka's anime-rama trilogy, Belladonna of Sadness, was an adaptation of Jules Michelet's Satanism and Witchcraft that adopted a much more serious tone than the first two installments, and leaned heavily on Art Nouveau painters as the inspiration for its look. It was a box office bomb in Japan, contributing significantly to Mushi's bankruptcy even as it caught the eye of international critics at the 23rd Berlin International Film Festival. The bankruptcy of Mushi, however, meant that official Western releases were sporadic at best. It was recently restored and scanned in 4K, 
from its sole surviving 35mm release print by Cinelicious Picks, and standing at a 90% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes, it is now considered a lost and found cult classic. Salvador Dali famously said, There is only one difference between a madman and me. I am not mad. Surrealists embraced idiosyncrasy and eschewed traditional framing, but always with a conscious desire to reach further self-expression. You might try a little surrealism today. You're on the internet right now. You can probably find a really good video on practicing automatic drawing. Or you could check out some of my other videos if you're all snuggled down and just ready for more content. Maybe like and subscribe if you haven't already, and leave me a comment. You know, if you've watched this far, uh, maybe work the words great googly moogly into your comments somewhere. That'll be our secret code. Until next time, watch like it means something. Thank you.